Deciding what anime to watch can be really hard sometimes. Whether you've seen one show or a thousand, we've all had points where you just can't seem to pick up a new one. And I personally have had this problem a lot recently. I want to watch more anime and find new shows that interest me, but I usually just spend all day scrolling through Twitter or binging YouTube videos instead of actually doing that. So in an effort to solve this problem, I had an idea. Why don't I just pick a completely random show and force myself to watch it? Or better yet, why don't I make something that does it for me? That's right, for this video I programmed a website that can select a completely random anime from the over 24,000 entries on my anime list. I call it AnimeRandomizer.com, and with one click of a button it can give me anything from Full Metal Alchemist, to an obscure music video, to things I definitely can't show on YouTube. So I am going to be challenging myself to watch and finish whatever my website picks for me, and I'll be reviewing everything I saw to let you know what's worth watching. I'm sure nothing will go wrong. All right, let's spin our first anime. I am a little nervous because in the past I have gotten some absolutely insane results while testing and creating this website, um, but I'm hoping that I get something good. So let's go spin. First spin of the day, what do we get? Okay. So the first anime we're checking out this video is Yoru no Yatterman or Yatterman Knight. And to explain Yatterman Knight to you properly, I really need to explain a lot of the context and history that led up to it. You see, it all starts with the studio who made it, Tatsunoko Production. Tatsunoko is pretty well established, having done work on Ping Pong the Animation, Psychopaths, and Evangelion. However, before all that, they were pretty prolific in the 70s and 80s, and one of their works at the time, and the one relevant to this video, is Time Boken. Time Boken was an anime series aimed at a younger audience that aired in 1975. It starred a teenage boy and girl duo who fight an evil trio of bad guys known as the Time Skeletons, over a magic gemstone that the girl's grandfather left behind alongside his time machine. Every episode features the Time Bokan gang getting into conflict with the Time Skeletons over this stone, and every episode ends with the heroes defeating the villains with some goofy looking mech that blows them up into space. Classic kids anime. So classic, in fact, that that last part might sound familiar to you. And if it does, that's probably because the Time Skeletons are the direct inspiration for Team Rocket from the Pokemon anime. Though, if you want to get really granular with the origins of the villain trio archetype, Time Bokan's villains were actually inspired by the 1961 Disney film Babes in Toyland, which was based on an earlier 1934 Laurel and Hardy film and stage production by Victor Herbert from back in 1903. Not really important you know any of that, but I think it's interesting. All you need to know is that Time Bokan was very successful and influential, and spawned many, many spin-off series that aired weekly until 1983, with some OVAs and revivals coming out all the way into the 2000s. These include such uniquely titled shows as Zendomen, Otaskumen, Yetadetamen, Ipatsumen, Itadakimen, Isatsumen, and Kiramekimen. Though, the first and most famous of all of them, and the one responsible for their strange naming convention, was a show named Yatterman. Yatterman ran from 1977 to 1979 with a total of 108 episodes. It featured a protagonist duo named Gan Takada and Ai Kaminari take on the mantle of Yatterman 1 and 2 to fight the evil trio known as the Duranbo Gang, composed of Duranjo, Boyaki, and Tanzura. The Duranbo Gang is led by the evil mastermind Dokurobe and runs scams and generally cause mischief in order to acquire a magical artifact. And every episode ends with the Yatterman thwarting the Duranbo gang with some animal-based mech and blowing them up into space. And following Yatterman's gigantic 108 episode run, it sort of went dormant until 2008, where it got an animated remake sequel thing, an animated movie in 2009, and a live action film that same year. The latter of which being the top movie at the Japanese box office when it came out. Like, I'm not joking when I say it made as much on opening weekend that year as Avatar. Though sadly less than Ned at the museum too. <laughs> and finally, the most recent piece of Yatterman content to be released is the show I'm watching today, Yatterman Night, which is a 12 episode follow up to the original that was released in 2015 to celebrate the series 40th anniversary. 
So to recap, I have randomly selected a 2015 show that is a spin-off sequel to the 2008 sequel remake to the 1977 anime that was itself a spin-off of another 1975 anime that took inspiration from a 1961 Disney film that remade an earlier 1934 Laurel and Hardy movie that was based on a 1903 operetta by Victor Herbert. I don't know how this keeps happening. <laughs> Though honestly, I'm pretty lucky that out of all the Yatterman properties I could have picked, I got Knight, because it actually works really well on its own and is quite different to what came before. How different might you ask? Well, let's get into the recap. Yatterman Knight opens with a bang. Literally. The show cold opens with a peaceful day in Japan being interrupted by the f***ing moon exploding, raining down debris and preceding a gigantic skull mushroom cloud that engulfs the entire area. Bro, what the hell? What is going on? Yeah, despite the entire franchise up until this point being goofy kids shows, this one starts with an apocalyptic event and a much more serious atmosphere. The entire show then takes place in this sort of soft post-apocalypse, with our main characters growing up in a destitute farmland just outside a nearby kingdom. These main characters are Dorothy, a single mother, Leopard, Dorothy's young daughter, Elephantus and Volcats, Dorothy and Leopard's two best friends, and finally their pet pig, Oda. Bro, Elephantus is my boy, look at that guy, look at how f***ing wide he is. <laughs> As Leopard grows up, she's read bedtime stories explaining the lore of the land. A long time ago, the prestigious Lord and Lady Yatterman fought and bested the evil Duranbo gang, who were trying to steal the moon. After saving the day and the world, the Yatterman then founded the Yatter Kingdom, and everyone has been living happily ever since. Everyone except for our protagonists, as we learn that they are actually descendants of the ancient Duranbo gang, with Leopard being related to Duranjo and Elephantus and Volcats being grandchildren of Tanzra and Boyaki. I'm not exactly sure of Oda's relation, but my headcanon is that he's somehow related to the pig from the original show too. And while this Yatter Kingdom is supposedly doing great, none of our characters happen to live inside it. So when Dorothy starts getting very sick one day, the trio sets out for the kingdom to get help. It's upon arriving at the Yatter's gate, however, that things start to take a turn. As when Leopard asks them to let her in to go get medicine, well... Turns out the Yattermen aren't nearly as nice as their stories portray them, and they shoot the gang away when they need them most. Because of this, Dorothy can't get her life-saving medicine, and in a dreamlike state she talks to Leopard, making her promise to smile for her even when times are tough, before she eventually passes away in her bed. It's at Dorothy's funeral that Leopard begins to think. Surely these Yattermen can't have been the heroes from her stories if they'd let cruelty like this happen. Perhaps the Duranbo gang were actually the good guys, fighting to save the day and prevent this cruelty. Perhaps Leopard should do the same. So Leopard, Elephantus, and Volcats take their pain and suffering and use it as motivation. They take their grief and use it as fuel. Fuel to don the costumes of their ancestors and rebuild the Duranbo gang. Except this time, they're gonna punish the Yattermen for what they let happen. Oh, hell yeah. That's kind of sick. I've never seen the original, that's kind of sick. And that is the pilot of Yatterman Night. And it is insanely good. I cannot stress how incredible of a premise this show has and how well it starts this story off. Having it be descendants of the originals and swapping their roles is such a cool idea. I didn't realize how much I wanted something like that until I saw this first episode, because frankly, it is a genius way to reboot an old franchise. 
Even after the pilot, the show continues to flex its ideas by showing off how great these main characters are. Because going into the rest of the show, our trio immediately tries very hard to imitate the original Duranbo gang. They try to take after their mannerisms and personalities, and they try to do what they think the OG gang would do. Which is fantastic, because this new gang is nothing like the original. The OG Duranjo was a vain femme fatale, whereas Leopard is a pure-hearted kid. The OG Tanzaro was a gruff henchman, whereas Elephantis is a gentle giant. And Volcats even has a recurring joke where he wants to learn what high school girls are, since the original Boyaki was a creepy pervert. But Volcats is a gentleman and hasn't seen a schoolgirl before, so he just keeps saying he wants to see one as a catchphrase without knowing what it means. <laughs> Honestly, it's great. And after our trio is established, the basic premise of Yatterman Knight follows them and their pet pig on their way inside the Yatter Kingdom, heading towards the capital city, Yatter Metropolis, to get revenge. Oh, even the pig has a mask. Oh my god. Oh, that is cute. Along the way, we meet two more main characters, named Ali and Gachen, who are also seeking revenge against the Yattermen for tragic backstory reasons. And these two sort of play the straight men to the main trio's Duranbo gang routine. We also meet our lead evil henchman, a man named Goro, who looks like a 13-year-old's Final Fantasy OC and has the insane overpowered moveset of one too. Naturally, Goro is joined by an army of evil robots who oppose our heroes at every turn. This sort of cements the backwards premise of this show quite nicely, as our heroes are very clearly the underdogs in the situation, and have to resort to clever tricks and dirty tactics every episode to stand a chance fighting the overtly strong villains, which does usually end up with the gang getting blown up at the end of every encounter in a fun twist on the original. The fight scenes before these episodic explosions are supremely fun though, as there's this clear goofy energy the gang brings that balances out a lot of the darker elements of the show. Even though these are rather serious encounters, we see stuff like Boyaki building a mech out of a vending machine at the last minute, or Duranjo setting traps that the villains fall into, or Tanzara just beating the shit out of people. And it's all amped up by the exaggerated animation and upbeat soundtrack that kicks in when the action gets started. There's a lot of over-the-top shots and compositions that actually reminded me a lot of something like Gurren Lagann, probably owing to the fact that the early episodes of that show also feature a ragtag group of heroes fighting with silly mechs in a pseudo-post-apocalypse which is only heightened even more by an insanely funny voice cast. I mean, Tanzara and Boyaki are voiced by All Might and Sanji, of all people, and Goro is voiced by Nobuyuki Hiyama, who plays adult Link in Ocarina of Time and Super Smash Bros. And all of them unnecessarily put like 110% into all their lines, which makes them so much fun to watch. <laughs> Though, while I am heaping praise on Yatterman Knight, I do also want to talk about some problems I had with it. The first of which being the pacing. Because the first three episodes of this show do a good job setting up the premise and characters, like I've explained. But then in episode four, the show just hits this weird back-to-back -back brick wall of episodic adventures, basically weekly side stories on the way to Yatter Metropolis, and it is very slow. The middle six episodes of this show are all these adventure of the week scenarios. And they're not bad, they're very obviously referential to the original series. The gang finds a new location every week and helps the people there with their problems, which usually ends up with them fighting Goro and his army. There's even an episode where they team up with the monkey from Speed Racer, like an actual children's show, and save the day using the Mach 5. Which is great, since Speed Racer is another Tatsunoko property. But that's like an entire episode of the show, which is really weird when it's right in the middle of this dramatic revenge story. 
And speaking of revenge, the other major problem I had with Yatterman Knight does have to do with the ending, which includes major spoilers. So if you want to avoid those, skip ahead to the next chapter or just pause here to watch the show yourself, because I want to talk about some pretty major plot points the show ends with. So after our six episodic adventures, our heroes find themselves at Yatter Metropolis, and the final three episodes are our confrontation with the villain. Naturally, when the gang enters the city, they do get immediately captured and overwhelmed by guards and elite generals, and are brought up to the giant evil spire in the middle of town that the villains are controlling everything from. Except, when they do get to the top, they aren't greeted by the Yattermen, who they think are responsible. Instead, stepping out of a giant ball of fire is Dokorobe. Dokorobe, if you'll remember, is the mastermind behind the original Duranbo gang, and the main villain of the original series. And he straight up says that the Yattermen are dead. He killed them after the original show, took their place, and ruled the kingdom in their name as a way to stay in control and ruin their legacy. And the reason our main trio grew up outside the kingdom is that he exiled the original gang after they failed him one too many times. So this is the big twist of the show. It's very dramatic, very referential to the original series, and I didn't like it. I didn't think it was a good twist. Because up until this point, the show was very clear with its themes, which were all centered around the hero and villain switch-up that the premise entailed. I mean, Leopard continually has this inner monologue about how her ancestors probably weren't the bad guys and might have been fighting for justice like she is. And there's a lot to be said about how we view our heroes and history being written by the victors. The whole show seems to be leading up to the descendants of the villains from the original confronting the former heroes and cementing a message about what being good actually means. Except they don't, because Dokorobe was in charge the whole time, and the Yattermen were good all along, and the OG Durambo were evil, and everything is exactly what we were told at the beginning, with our heroes being essentially just wrong, which is not a good plot point to me. I don't think that makes the show better. I didn't like it. And after this reveal, the show continues to have some pretty compelling plot points. I won't even spoil those here, but there's some great reveals and the show ends with a climactic fight that felt very satisfying. Lots of the characters get major arcs that wrap up, especially Ali and Gachan, and it ends with a great bit about having done right by those you've lost. It is genuinely a good ending, it was just soured by the reveal that the mastermind all along was this random dude that you only really recognize if you've seen the original show. It felt very weak in comparison to every other plot point we get at the end of the series. What the f- <laughs> So honestly, going into Yatterman Night, having zero expectations, I was blown away. It is so much better than it has any right being. And even knowing the context, I still can't believe they went this hard on the premise. I mean, it's basically what if Team Rocket were the good guys? That's the coolest idea ever! And it delivers on that premise quite nicely. The animation, soundtrack, and overall production work very well to tell a good story. The characters are all super interesting and have good chemistry together. In fact, I'd say the chemistry between the main trio is the highlight of the entire show, only really being followed up by how much fun everyone seems to be having, especially the villains who are just hamming it up the entire time. It's just a bit unfortunate that the pacing is so slow in the middle and the ending isn't quite what it could have been, because I feel like if the show lived all the way up to its potential, it could have been one of my favorites. A darker spin on an older kids show that flips the heroes and villains around and does this much to spice up the premise would have been right up my alley. Yatterman Knight just didn't quite get there. It got most of the way there, it's very fun for the most part, it just stumbled a little too much to be amazing. So I'm gonna give Yatterman Knight a solid can watch. It's one of the more unique ideas I've seen for a reboot, and it's very easy to binge for the most part. You'll definitely enjoy it if anything I've talked about so far was interesting to you, but I personally just wanted a bit more out of it that I didn't quite get. Okay, so my first spin of this video was actually surprisingly good. I really enjoyed Yorano Yatterman a lot more than I thought I would, and I feel like I have gotten 
really lucky with my spin so far because in testing my own website and even using the website I used in my last video, I got a lot of really bad results. So I am really scared that I'm going to get something that's just terrible now. Uh, so I'm going to spin again. Hopefully we keep this, uh, we keep this train going. Oh, interesting. Isn't this a, I've heard of this movie before. The Girl Who Leapt Through Time, or Tokyo Kakuro Shoujo, is a 2006 anime film directed by Mamoru Hosoda, animated by Madhouse, and based on the novel by Yasutaka Susui. This movie was actually first recommended to me in a comment by user Masked Fox, and I'll tell you right now that it is very funny that they recommended it for reasons that will become apparent later. But for right now, thank you very much because what a movie to watch. Now it isn't nearly as beloved as juggernauts like Your Name or anything Ghibli related, and the online conversation around it does seem quite minimal, but as you'll see, those who like The Girl Who Leapt Through Time really like it. It's got fantastic reviews, it's won several awards, including Animation of the Year from the Japan Film Academy, and despite being shown in a limited number of theaters, there's a story about how in theater Shinjuku, so many people wanted to buy tickets for it that they stood up in the theater to watch it for several days before it eventually got a wider release. Which all probably makes a lot of sense to anyone who recognizes the names I mentioned were attached to this project. I mean, Susui is a highly regarded sci-fi author, having also written the original novel for Paprika. Mamoru Hosoda later went on to make the first non-Ghibli anime movie to be nominated for an Oscar, and Madhouse is… well, Madhouse. Throw a dart in the wall full of the best anime ever made, and there's a good chance you land on something they produced. So I don't have too many more bits of trivia about this movie in particular, like I did with Yadam and Knight. As we'll get into, it's pretty straightforward. However, I do think it's fun to bring up how many alternate versions this story has. Because Jesus Christ, there are more adaptations of The Girl Who Leapt Through Time than like any single piece of media I've ever seen. These adaptations include a 1972 television series, a 1983 live-action film, a 1983 short story based on the 1983 live-action film, a 1985 drama, a 1994 drama, a 2002 TV film, a 2004 manga adaptation, a 2006 anime film, a 2006 manga adaptation of that 2006 anime film, a 2010 live-action film, a 2010 manga prequel to that 2010 live-action film, a 2016 drama, and finally, a stage play in 2017. People really like adapting this story. I mean, the adaptation section on Wikipedia is longer than the rest of the article. But as much as I want to make a four hour long video comparing and contrasting every version of this story, I will instead simply tell you about the 2006 anime film that I picked and what it's all about. So let's get into that. The Girl Who Leapt Through Time begins with a girl. Take a wild guess what she does later in the movie. This girl is named Makoto, and she's a 17-year-old high school student going to Kuranose High School in Tokyo. We first meet her on July 13th, being abruptly woken from a dream by an alarm clock falling on her head. As she's almost late for school, she bikes frantically down the street, almost smacking right into a railroad crossing before eventually making it to class. And her bad luck that day only continues. She's late to class alongside her friend Chiaki, which earns them both playful teasing from their other friend, Kusuke. Makoto then fails the surprise exam she has that day. She has an accident in home ec class that starts a grease fire, and she even gets into a dog pile when some boys playing on the lawn crash into her. After this honestly dreadful time, Makoto only has a moment to relax taking some notebooks up to an empty classroom. While inside, she sees time waits for no one, curiously written on a chalkboard, and hears something in the nearby science lab. However, the only thing inside is a strange glowing walnut that falls in front of her. Bending over to pick it up, a shadowy figure enters the room, causing Makoto to stumble and fall onto the walnut, and seemingly through space and time. Whoa, what the After a long sequence of her flying through what looks to be the entire history of humanity, Makoto finally lands back on the floor of the classroom, alone and confused at what just happened. Later, after school, Makoto bikes home down the same busy street she did that morning. The train is coming again, so she tries to brake a bit further up the hill than last time. But as she squeezes the handle, it doesn't work. 
Makoto tries to stop her bike as it barrels down the steep hill, building speed and blowing past a woman and her kid on the way down. She does everything she can to avoid a crash, but she can't do anything. Makoto hits the crossing bar and flies off her bike. But as Makoto is about to get hit, she instead slams straight into the woman she blew past earlier. She gets up, looks around, and sees the train pass right on by like nothing happened. Because nothing did happen. As our protagonist will soon discover, she's gained the ability to reverse time whenever she leaps through the air. Now I'm a big fan of time travel stories, especially ones along the vein of Groundhog's Day. Seeing people relive moments in their life, or really just seeing how time travel affects someone's day to day is fascinating. So this movie is right up my alley. It's that perfect blend of science fiction premise clashing with a slice of life plotline. And Makoto uses her powers pretty much exactly how you'd expect someone who got them would. She relives her terrible day, acing her exam, and swapping with a classmate in home ec so they start a fire instead. After school, she goes to karaoke and resets a whole bunch so she can sing for 10 hours straight. She even goes back several days to the night her parents made teppanyaki just because she was craving that for dinner. It's that exact sort of wish fulfillment I think everyone dreams about, and Makoto acts just like I'm sure anyone watching this would if they got these powers in high school. Like yeah, I'd probably use time travel powers to eat a nice dinner again too. Why not? In fact, Makoto's character in general and these sort of subdued relationships with her friends in the movie feel incredibly real. The voice actors do such a great job at being naturalistic and not heightened anime characters. Which really sells this idea that we're watching a normal high school girl struggle with issues a normal high school girl would. Plus, you know, time travel powers. <laughs> And this is all complemented, of course, by the insanely beautiful animation, which fits right in with the naturalistic characters as it just paints the background with some gorgeous skylines and well-defined cityscapes. Again, the movie succeeds at being as grounded as it can, but the long shots of friends just playing baseball or hanging out at school are really easy to watch. Madhouse, and Mamoru Hosoda in particular, did a really great job making something visually interesting out of what would just be boring compositions in a regular anime. Though I'd expect nothing less of the man who was first picked to direct Howl's Moving Castle. So after stuffing this thing with enough praise to make it burst, I am going to go into the spoilers a bit early, because if you have any interest in watching this movie, I'd say you should absolutely do it. I don't want to ruin any of the plot details for you. But I do want to cover some of the final plot points, so skip to the next chapter to avoid that if you want. So as we come to find out throughout the plot of the movie, the girl who leapt through time is primarily a love story, and a very messy one at that. Uh, messy in a good way, I should say. Early on, after getting her new powers, Makoto is asked out by one of her best friends, Chiaki. She doesn't think she has feelings for him, and so she leaps back to before he asks the question and avoids him altogether. She doesn't want to think about her friend's crush on her, and this ends up driving a wedge between them. Throughout the course of the movie, Makoto and Shiaki's friendship then just becomes more and more strained. She eventually doesn't hang out with other friends. She stops talking to her classmate Yuri when Yuri ends up hanging out with Chiaki in her place. Things just start spiraling out of control. This culminates in a series of events where Makoto ends up reliving her awful day again, and in trying to subtly change the events in order to get something she wants, she ends up nearly killing her friend Kusuke, when her changes to the timeline send him home on her broken bike. Makoto tries to stop this, though it's actually Chiaki who saves Kusuke, and reveals himself as the time traveler that dropped the walnut, giving Makoto her powers. However, both Chiaki and Makoto had been using up a finite number of time leaps, and so by saving Kusuke, Chiaki is stuck in the present, which depresses him enough to make him disappear, leaving Makoto alone to cry and confront her feelings for him. Now, as the events of the movie have unfolded, Makoto has been talking to her aunt Kazuko, an art restorer person who's been working on the very painting that Chiaki time-traveled back to see. 
Kazuko has been giving advice to Makoto and guiding her to make better decisions using her powers. In fact, she's the one who tells Makoto she might have powers in the first place. Fully believing everything Makoto tells her. And it's in Makoto's final talk to her, sad over the loss of Chiaki, that Kazuko lets on why she believed her. You see, in the original The Girl Who Leapt Through Time novel, the protagonist was a girl named Kazuko. And she developed timely powers, used them for her own gain, and ended up having to let go of a boy she liked. And while movie Kazuko never explains her connection to the original, it is made abundantly clear this is the same character, who tells Makoto her story of losing someone she loved and not fighting hard enough to be with them. This, in turn, causes Makoto to realize she's got one time leap left, one Chiaki reset when he saved Kusuke. And so Makoto uses it to reset Chiaki's last leap, going back to the very first day of the movie. The two of them have a heart-to-heart -heart and confirm their feelings for each other, and Chiaki leaves to go back to his time in the future, promising to wait for Makoto when he gets there. Damn. Damn. I really love this ending, and the relationship between Chiaki and Makoto in general. Because while this movie is clearly a romance, it is surprisingly complex with how it portrays everyone's feelings towards each other. I mean, right off the bat, Chiaki asks Makoto out in this super awkward scene. Makoto. Hmm? Oh my god. That's so cute. They then have this sort of complicated dynamic where they both feel something but don't want to talk about it and it starts to break them apart. And even at the end, it isn't a big climactic kiss or anything, they don't even really say they like each other, they just sort of know. And that, to me, is the genius of The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. There's a lot of decisions the film makes that make it a much messier story. It's not as neatly defined as something like even Steins Gate, which came out years after. But it's that messiness that makes it hit so much harder for me because it's so much closer to real life that way. I can just imagine myself in any of these situations. And I especially love how it ties the story to the original novel with Kazuko the Ant. I haven't read the novel personally, so I don't know the full story beyond plot summaries on the internet. Honestly, if you're watching the movie first, you're not even going to know why she's important. But having that context is beneficial because it very elegantly carries the themes of regret and fixing mistakes all the way through. It's not just leaping through time to fix things, it's giving advice to younger generations so they don't make the same mistakes. Which is extremely cool to add when it's not even something most people will pick up on without being familiar with the original work. So overall, The Girl Who Leapt Through Time is an incredibly well put together movie that really captures the high school relationship experience in such a grounded and personal way that few other anime I've seen have quite done. The production on it is fantastic, and everything from the voice acting to the sound design help fit into this consistently enjoyable watch. This feels like the perfect date movie. It's got a good blend of feel-good emotion and nostalgia for high school with some very basic and fun sci-fi beats that come across as compelling without feeling sappy. I basically have zero complaints about it, other than Maybe it could have used some more time travel shenanigans, but honestly, if you want that, just go watch Steins Gate. This is basically a stripped down version of Steins Gate before Steins Gate even came out. And that's like my favorite anime of all time, so this ranks pretty highly for me. The Girl Who Leapt Through Time is a definite should watch. You're almost guaranteed to have fun watching this movie. So unless you hate fun, you should check it out. I have gotten really, really lucky this video. I have rolled two honestly pretty good anime. One that was a pretty good show to watch and a movie that was honestly really good. However, I am worried that people are going to start thinking that my my randomizer is like rigged or something because it has only been good anime, which is crazy to me. Um, but let's see what we get. Third spin, let's go. Yeah, okay, that'll do it. That'll do it. Oh, f oh no. 
What is this? And so our third and final anime for today is by Beyond Bulu K fourth season or Magic Blocks fourth season, I believe, which is a Paw Patrol-esque children's show about transforming robots that help kids learn about different kinds of vehicles and is entirely in Chinese with no English translations anywhere online that I could find. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what I expected, and I certainly didn't know what anyone was saying in this show. Okay, there's gotta be like subtitles or something, right? I have basically nothing to go on here. The show's My Anime List page didn't even have anything written in it. I had to go to a third-party Chinese summary website that I'm almost certain got translated incorrectly by Google. But fortunately, I kind of knew something like this would happen. Uh, to be honest, despite how professional it may look, my website is not great, and I am shocked I even got two decent shows out of it to begin with. But because I knew there was a good chance I'd get something like this, I did come prepared. You see, a little while ago, I made posts on YouTube and Patreon asking people to recommend me anime, and a ton of you very sincerely commented shows you'd think I'd like, which is incredibly kind of you. But what you probably didn't know was that I was tricking you the entire time, and I was secretly adding all 350 plus shows you suggested to a massive wheel that I'd be using for this exact video. I knew all along that if I ended up spinning some terrible, untranslated kids show on my dumb little website, I'd be spinning this wheel of recommendations and watching what it gives me instead. And so, now is the time to do that. Though I will point out that one of the shows that was originally on that recommendation wheel was The Girl Who Leapt Through Time, which my website picked anyway. Don't know what the odds of that happening were, but it makes this reveal very funny in hindsight. Okay, so I have a wheel that has 353 anime recommendations that people have commented, um, and we're just going to spin it and watch 12 episodes of something that is not a weird Chinese kids show. <laughs> let's, let's see what it says. Oh, hell yeah. Okay. Wow, that's actually really good. Trigun Stampede, recommended by Newton Witter, is a very new 12-episode 3D CG anime that just finished airing while I was writing this video. I promise that's a coincidence. Uh, you saw me spin the wheel. I, I don't know how I'd rig that. <laughs> Stampede is produced by Studio Orange, who previously worked on Land of the Lustrous and Beastars. It's also directed by Kenji Muto and based on the original Trigun manga by Yasuhiro Naito. Now, you've probably heard of Trigun before. I mean, if you somehow stumbled upon this video and don't know there's an original anime from 1998, I don't believe you, because it's Trigun. It's like one of the most beloved shows of all time, to the point that even just running an anime channel, I get comments nearly every day from random people asking my opinion on it, on completely unrelated videos. You could scroll down to the comments right now, and I would be shocked if most of them aren't by people talking about Trigun. And, uh, those people might be a little disappointed to find out. I've never seen it. I have not watched the original Trigun. Cowboy Bebop is one of my favorite shows ever, and I literally cannot stop talking about how much I love space westerns, and I just never saw Trigun for some reason. Which means I share at least one thing in common with, like, most of Japan, because the original show, as I found out, is infinitely more popular in the West than it is anywhere else. As far as I can tell, it's basically considered a flop in Japan, and it's just considered yet another 90s anime, Lost in the Crowd. Whereas it got released on Adult Swim in America, which instantly propelled it to cult classic status, the second 90s kid saw Vash holding a big gun. Wherever this man goes, he always leaves trouble behind him. Get down! Over half the town ain't nothing but rubble. It's back to Stampede, he's coming our way, he's coming! Dragon. Premiering Monday, March 31st at midnight on Adult Swim. Draw, partner. And so, Trigun Stampede is basically a remake slash retelling of the original Trigun anime, 
taking a different approach to adapting the manga as a sort of attempt to get new people into the series. It was made with involvement from the manga's creator, who seems like a really cool guy when it comes to adaptations, and the main focus of the remake is elaborating on parts of the story the 90s anime didn't quite cover. Did it succeed in doing that? Well, let's get into the recap. Trigun Stampede cold opens its story with a spaceship hovering above a planet. On board, someone wearing a lab coat walks into some form of cryo chamber before the ship suddenly begins taking damage. We see a young boy named Vash running down the hallway before getting put into an escape pod alongside their twin brother, Nai. What looks to be their caretaker, a woman named Rem, says she's happy to have met them and the escape pod takes off as the ship explodes behind it. Wow. That was sick. That was real cool. After a title card, we're now in a desert somewhere, listening to a radio announcement as two people drive by. It's explained the desert is actually an entire desert planet named No Man's Land, and we see a giant sandworm breaching in the distance to help set the mood as we meet our characters. The main duo for right now is a pair of reporters. A gruff, day-drinking veteran by the name of Roberto is taking his apprentice of sorts, named Merrill, out to investigate a big case. They're looking for someone named Vash the Stampede, nicknamed the Humanoid Typhoon, who has a massive bounty of six million double dollars. After their car breaks down, Merrill and Roberto end up stumbling into someone matching Vash's description, a blonde-haired man with a big red jacket. And so, they take him into a nearby town for questioning. At a small village by the name of Genioa Rock, Merrill and Roberto are surprised to discover the town folks seem to love Vash. They all check in on him as he's brought back and ask him to take a look at the water plant in the center of town, which apparently he fixed before, earning the town's respect. We learn this plant is some sort of biological generator that produces all the resources necessary to survive on No Man's Land, and it's a remnant from a previous age that humanity has lost the ability to make more of. The one in Genioa Rock is actually housed in a crashed spaceship that the town was built around, though it seems like it's on its last legs. As Vash talks about the cost of fixing it or buying a new one, the police show up having finally tracked down their bounty. They flash a wanted poster of Vash and try to bring him in. Oh, fuck. But it's Roberto who stands up for our goofy gunslinger, using his influence as a reporter to convince the police captain to duel Vash for his freedom. At the top of Genioa Rock, as the sun is setting, Vash and the captain stand off. Vash seems uncomfortable with the idea of shooting someone, and so the captain seemingly drops his gun as well. Before... Oh my god! Jesus. Vash dramatically tells everyone to get inside, faces off with the falling explosives, pulls out his revolver, and... Out of ammo, Vash pathetically asks everyone for some bullets, which Meryl grabs from the bartender and throws to him. The police chief shoots at Vash and tries to stop him from firing, but Vash just beats him hand to hand before throwing a rock into the air, shooting it to splinter, and detonating the cluster bombs right above him. After everything calms down, Roberto asks why Vash seems so concerned over a dying plant, and Vash says he's afraid of his brother, Millions Knives. As he says this, we see a memory wherein Knives laughs over the crashing spaceship, having been responsible for the accident. So this flashback leads into a grown-up Knives playing the piano ominously, and the episode ends. Oh my god, this pilot is awesome. Crazy sci-fi concepts, a sick Mad Max meets Dune type setting, ridiculously cool action scenes, a dude named Millions Knives. I don't know why I didn't get recommended Trigun earlier. Okay, no, stop. That, no, that is not fair. Honestly, if that first episode doesn't hook you immediately into this show, I don't know what could. It sets up an intriguing plot that makes you want to watch more, it introduces characters that are supremely memorable. I mean, Vash, Roberto, and Meryl are likable from the first 30 seconds you see them, and the captain of the guard is only in the show for like 30 seconds, and I loved him. And he's not even in the top 10 characters in this show. And speaking of cool, the production on this show just is. 
The soundtrack has this intense orchestral vibe that goes from grungy synths to upbeat sci-fi to traditional western depending on the situation. I don't think I can give the composer Tatsuya Kato enough credit because this is the first soundtrack aside from Mad Max Fury Road that I've just listened to in my spare time. The goddamn main villain comes out to a piano solo for god's sakes. You won't get to hear it unless you watch the Patreon version of this video, but it makes Elle's theme seem like a child wrote it. Anyways, while talking about the animation, Studio Orange absolutely knocked it out of the park here. The 3D camera moves and dynamic choreography on display are so visually stunning, I just found myself re-watching little clips and segments of the action sequences because they come at you so quick. It works so well in a show like this. Though, you'll have a hard time convincing anyone on the internet of that, because 3D animation in general is just constantly dunked on by the anime community, especially compared to the now-sacred 90s aesthetic of the original Trigun. People seriously reacted to finding out this show had CG in it, worse than they'd react to finding out it was made with child labor. Which, yeah, 3D CG can look bad, just like 2D animation can. I think it's entirely gotten a bad rap because a lot of CG is used as a cost-cutting measure. You know, a studio can't do some complex shot on time, so they 3D model it and ship that out instead. And when a 3D animation is rushed or imperfect, it stands out way more than 2D does. But when CG is used purposefully, with enough time and effort put in, like in Trigun Stampede, you get stuff like this. <laughs> And if you think that doesn't look great, please close out of this video and never look at my channel again because you're a liar and I don't want to be associated with you. The CG in Stampede is absolutely phenomenal. In parts, I'd even say it looks better than 2D could simply because they can whip the camera around like crazy and do stuff that traditional animation can't without like a decade spent making it. And the show even flexes on you by including several segments of just traditional animation purely as a stylistic choice. I legitimately don't see how someone could think any of this looks bad after watching it. And after watching it, up until the final episode of the season, I think this is definitely something people should go into knowing nothing. Even if you've seen the original Trigun, as far as I can tell, a lot of the plot points and developments are new here. So I'm not even gonna do a spoiler segment. I love the later plot of the show, but there's nothing in it that I have that much to talk about, and it's incredibly new. So I don't want to ruin the experience for anyone. Just trust me when I say that it's good. <laughs> Bug. Trigun Stampede is one of the best shows I've seen in a while. Mostly because it's one of the most appealing shows I've seen in a while. It hits every single note I like in my media, and it does everything I wanted it to extremely well. To the point that I'm having trouble even thinking of things to criticize or talk about negatively. I just can't think of any. Though, if you want to hear overtly negative nitpicky opinions about it, you can easily find dozens of clickbait videos on YouTube or 10,000 word essays on my anime list that have plenty of that. And a lot of people are probably going to ask me to watch the original now just because I liked Stampede, some of them even doing so because they want me to see that the original is way better or whatever, and I just want to say, I don't care. I could not care less if Trigun 98 is better or different or Stampede doesn't do the story justice, and I say that as someone whose earliest public video is me ripping apart Cowboy Bebop's Netflix remake. I just enjoyed this story and liked this show and what it did. I'd honestly give it a must watch, just on the basis that if you like space westerns and cool action as much as I do, this show is pretty much perfect at it. And don't worry, I will watch the 98 anime, I'm getting around to that very soon, you don't have to leave a comment reminding me. I'm gonna watch it, I'm gonna love it. But if Stampede's purpose was to get people into the original anime, then I'd say it did its job perfectly. And that's three more random anime watched in their entirety and reviewed for you. I'm actually really happy with the selection of shows I got this time. All three were incredibly meaty and had a ton of stuff for me to dig into and enjoy. It's pretty crazy how well picking random anime worked out here. I cannot guarantee that my website will give anything near this good of results if you try it for yourself. In fact, it'll probably be a lot closer to stuff like Bye Beyond Bulu K. But it worked out for me, so that's all I care about. <laughs> 
And if you're interested in my website, I am putting up a video on my second channel that goes over how it works and how you can make something like it yourself. You should be able to check that out here. I am gonna try and add more features and make it look nicer in the future, but it is just a side project, so someone who's a better programmer than me can make something a little more robust if they want. I also tried to do something a little different with this video compared to last time. In the previous version of this, I just recapped and went over the entire show as I saw it and then gave my thoughts at the end. And I was originally going to do that again here. I actually had about 20,000 words written for just the first two shows, which would have been over twice or three times as long as this video currently is. But I wanted to spice things up since recapping whole episodes at a time is just kind of boring and takes a long time. And also being able to segment off spoilers seemed like a good idea. So let me know in the comments what you thought of the formats, whether you liked this or the last video structure more. I'm interested to hear your feedback on it. And finally, thank you to the patrons, whose names have probably been scrolling up for a while now. If you want your name at the end of one of my videos, check out patreon.com slash Lextorious. It's only a dollar a month, and I'm adding a bunch of new stuff to it, like a monthly Q&A that's up right now where you can ask me anything you want. I also want to do polls in the future where you can vote on what video I make next, and this is all alongside the behind-the-scenes posts and regular updates I'm already putting out there. Check that out if you haven't already. Thank you so much for watching. My next video should be coming out pretty soon and will be pretty interesting to you if you like Trigun. So stay tuned for that. I'll see you next time.